So before I start, I want to I want to tell you a little story about the motivation behind this presentation and and um, how it came about. So first of all, um, the security industry doesn't really have a de facto skills indicator. Like we have certificates and competitions and and people have exploit DB accounts and all this other stuff that we can talk about individually, but there's no like one single way to rank people, rank teams or people against each other. And that might be a good or a bad thing. But um, other industries tend to have something like this, like maybe not as ranked or ordered, but a way to um, tell individuals apart um, through a standardized method. Um, and I think CTF has the potential to be this skills indicator. And CTF's uh, providing huge educational and professional value can fit this skill indicator pretty well. Um, I also want to tell you a story about a, a DEF CON CTF challenge that I was working on this summer. Um, the challenge was um, first engineering challenge for a backdoored SSH server. And they push you down the binary, and what you have to do is you have to figure out how the how the how the SSH was backdoored and get the key. And this the binary also came with a file, which looked like some kind of like output log file that where the passwords were being stored. Like so backdoored SSH would spit out the password that you type into a log file so the attacker can come back later and steal your passwords. So you know, we see that great. Now we go through the process of reversing this backdoor SSH server and um, spend maybe eight, ten hours on it. And then someone goes like, oh, we solved that. It was just the log file XORed with FFFF. And that was the key. So that's what, that's what I would consider. That's not, a, that's not a horrible challenge, but that's what I would consider a, a poorly written challenge, a poorly designed challenge. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. So this talk is called... Uh, the theory and application of realistic capture the flag competitions. This is a little bit of a joke. This is the kind of title you would see on an academic paper where capture the flag competitions are really practical and realistic and the opposite of academic papers. Um, so who the hell am I and why did they let me talk to you guys about this? Um, I'm Julian. I currently run the CTF team at NYU Poly. We're called Brooklyn's Overflow. We're ranked uh, the top in the top five percent in the world, according to CTFtime.org. Um, I currently I've been running Seesaw CTF for the past three years, and uh, the most recent Seesaw CTF was the largest CTF competition ever held. I also help out uh, running Ghost in the Shell Code, which is held at ChimuCon, and um, I played with Hates Irony, Paintsec, and Mobile Disco. And I've helped out with uh, a couple other smaller CTFs all over the place. Um, and I went to DEF CON finals twice. Um, so what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about what capture the flag competitions are, uh, what, kinds of, what kinds of competitions there are, wh what a capture the flag competition is, what kinds of competitions there are, who should play them, what do challenges look like, what do good challenges look like, what do bad challenges look like, and what do realistic challenges look like. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience running Seesaw CTF, so if you want to run your own CTF, um, this is sort of like a primer to that. And um, throughout the slides, there'll be a bunch of resources, so if you want to play CTF, get involved, run a CTF, um, and the slides will be made available, so you don't have to copy down any links or anything like that. So capture the flag. How many people have no idea what a capture the flag competition? How many people are Dr. Cox right now? Oh, nobody. That's great. Um, well, I'm going to tell you anyway because the next four slides are about it. Um, so capture the flag is exactly what it sounds like. Competitors running around trying to find flags. But they're not trying to find these kind of flags or these kind of flags or even these kind of flags. They're trying to find these kind of flags. Um, and this is, this is the scene from Hackers where Joey first breaks into the Gibson and uh, his mother turns his computer off. 
So to formally define it, uh, I, I define this capture flag competition as an offensive security competition where teams solve uh, security challenges for points. And um, after they solve the challenge, a flag is presented to them and they turn in the flag for points on the score server. Um, so there's lots of different types of CTF competitions. Um, the most popular or the, or the easiest to run is this Jeopardy style. And the way this works is the organizers just write a series of disjointed, unrelated challenges and they throw them up on a board that looks something like this and then you solve each challenge separately. And we call that Jeopardy style. I don't know why. Probably because it looks like Jeopardy. But a lot of the a lot of the other a lot of boards that a lot of other CTF competitions that we call Jeopardy style don't look like Jeopardy. Uh, another type of competition is uh, an attack and defense style competition. The way this works is you're either given um, a VM image that you have to host yourself, or they host it for you and you log into it and you have um, either root or some kind of limited access to the box. And um, the way the scoreboard server is laid out here is there's a series of challenges. Like, so you have a dozen or so challenges, and um, those are the services that are running on your VM. And then you have points. So there's this, this kind of competition is multifaceted because you have to do three things. You have to keep your vulnerable services up. You have to find the vulnerabilities in your vulnerable services, write exploits for them, and attack the other teams on your network. And you want to patch the vulnerabilities in your vulnerable services so those teams can attack you. Um, and just, uh, there are all different kinds of CTF competitions. Plaid CTF last year wrote a third person RPG and you would walk around this little world and find hints and clues and you'd have to walk to your challenge to actually play your challenge. So I put it in its own category, but it would really still fall under Jeopardy. So there are tons of CTF competitions. Tons. Um, this, is, this is a very, very abbreviated list um, of CTF competitions. So all these different types of competitions, all these, they're, they're all a little bit different. Each of them have different game dynamics. And what I mean is when you go into and start playing these CTFs, the gameplay is going to be different and your strategy to approaching each type of competition is going to be different. For instance, if you have a team of 10 people, uh, and you have five exploiters, one network guy, one forensics guy, one crypto guy, and, I don't know, something else, one web guy, um, you're going you're gonna to take a different approach to the Jeopardy style, the Jeopardy style CTFs than you're going to take to the attack and defense CTFs because you're going to need to allocate more guys for networking on your tech defense CTF. Even though you have one guy, you have to acknowledge that there's going to be uh, a lot of network traffic involved in the competition. And each different competition has different ways, uh, has different ways of assessing you. So the team that has five exploiters might do really well at the Jeopardy style competitions, but might do really poorly on the attack and defense competitions. And um, capture the flag competitions are great for everyone. They're great for students for learning, uh, teachers for teaching, professionals to grow professionally and skillfully. Um, they're great team building exercises. And um, from a manager's perspective, like if you run a red team, um, it might not be the best idea to go into engagement with an entirely new managerial style, test it out at a CTF where the stakes aren't so high and see how it works and then bring it back to work. Um, so now we're going to talk about any questions about different types of CTF challenge, uh, competitions? Okay, so now we're going to talk about challenges. And CTF challenges are kind of like a car wreck. Both, both solving and uh, writing them. So the first point I want to make is designing and building these challenges is not trivial. A lot of times, you, your first CTF, you go in, you're like, oh, this challenge sucks. But it's really hard to write these challenges. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about this. Um, poorly designed challenges lead competitors down chasing pointless threads. That means, uh, like the example I gave you earlier, 
a challenge that wasn't designed well might lead someone down the wrong path and waste a lot of their time. And the competitions are time limited. You have 24 hours, 48 hours. You waste eight hours on one challenge, that sucks. Um, poorly built challenges can't stand a beating. If you write a web server that and at, for a competition that has 100 competitors and it can't take 20 requests a second, it's not going to function. Um, someone's going to run SQL map against it and you're going to be screwed. Um, design flaws might cause challenges to be solved in, the unintended, in an unintended way. Um, obviously, if you write a vulnerable challenge and it has more than one vulnerability, someone's going to find the second vulnerability. So not only do you need to be a good programmer, but you also need to be good at security to write good challenges. And uh, finally, what I think the most important part of this talk is the realism of each challenge, uh, it, of, of certain challenges, what separates the best challenges from the rest. And uh, we'll talk a lot about that. Also, so we're going to talk about something called critical points. A critical point is a specific location in the process of solving a challenge where the competitor, you, needs to make a decision or a realization about the challenge. And we're going to go through an example where I'm going to point out the critical points and why they're so critical. And as a challenge designer, you need to consider these critical points when designing the challenge so the competitor doesn't make the wrong decision or the wrong realization. And the critical points are going to show up down here. Um, so the fir our first case study is going to be an easy exploitation challenge. And I promise, like, there's a lot of details in here, but I won't bore them with you. So you're given a binary file. Just, that's it. And so you download the file, you run the file command on it. It tells you it's a, it's a Linux elf binary. Great. This is a critical point, because if you downloaded this file, and you ran file on it, and it told you it was a JPEG, you wouldn't be able to continue down the correct path. Now, some people like to do that. Confuse, like, do, do this, like, uh, bait and switch thing, like, where you're given a file, but it's not really what it says it is. And um, that, has, that has certain effect, but that's what separates great challenges from bad challenges. Um, if you can design a challenge that's technically complicated, but also doesn't frustrate the user by confusing them unnecessarily. Um, that's, what, that's the separation. OK. So we open up an IDA. It's a very clean graph. This is, this is an easy challenge. It's not supposed to be difficult. Uh, the first thing we see is it has an IP address and a port. So this is great. This is, this is a critical point. The user realizes this is a remotely, a remotely accessible service. Because this is not 0.0.0, .0 this is a real IP address on the internet. Um, yeah. So we take the port number from hexadecimal and we connect to it. <laughs> so at the top, I interacted with the service as a regular user, what a normal user would type in. And the bottom, and then something weird in the second line. So on the bottom, I typed in less characters to see what happened. This is also a critical point because the competitor realizes that there's something going on in this first field up here. Uh, who wants to take a guess what's going on? And obviously, something's going on because they're different. Right. But does it echo back here? So why did it echo back up there? Also, is there something funny going on over here with this E? Oh, so there's so the the beginning of the where in the second line was overwritten by the I A N and the new line. Um, and it was printed back out to the user. So we can assume there's some kind of memory corruption, whatever, but we don't really know exactly what's going on. We've got to go back to the binary and figure it out. But, we, but this was, if, if this didn't happen, 
when the user typed it in, the user would have to dig through the file to be able to find the memory corruption. This is this is like, hey, the 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 part you have to go to next is here. That's what the that's what the challenge writer is trying to tell you. And um, so we go back to the binary. We find uh, there's this part of the binary where it takes in a key file from the file system and it reads 32 buff 32 into buff. No big deal. Then we find this other part of the binary that takes this special val uh, variable var c. It compares it against zero and four one four one four one four one. And if it's not equal to either of those values, it takes that buff that we just wrote the key file into and sends it back to the user. That that sounds like what we want, right? We want the key file to be sent to the user. That's the competitor. Um, so that would be the solution to the challenge. So now the goal is to change this var c to be not zero and not four one four one four one. Does everyone follow me? So then we find this other part of the program where we read 32 bytes into var 28. And this is actually the first, uh, the first question that you see where I typed in Julian um, into the program. And then we take a quick look at the stack and we see var 28 is only four bytes long. And that's how we ended up with the memory corruption that showed you the, the end of Julian being written back to the user. So this part of memory right here is actually, uh, is actually a buffer on the stack that contains the, the, que the second question. So I overwrote the second question, but what's down here? Var C, exactly 28 bytes away. So we can overwrite the entirety of var C, change it to whatever we want. And so the first one is we type all A's. And because that gives us the value 4141414 in var C, it doesn't print out the flag. But when we type in all B's, we get the flag. Make sense? So, so great challenges um, force you force you to learn something, and give you the opportunity to learn something. Now, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to learn here, but imagine if you were if you were not very if you were not well versed in binary exploitation. If you um, if you're a student just starting out, or um, like uh, if you're so the target audience of uh, CSAW CTF, this would be one of our first challenges where. You're an undergrad, don't really know a lot about binary exploitation, but uh, this is a real simple challenge to t sort of walk you through the steps it would take to solve one of these. And this might take a beginner a couple hours. Um, but this doesn't waste your time with telling you, like, oh, the binary file is a JPEG. Oh, you know, we don't know where the memory corruption is. You have to go find it. Um, it, it presents all those, all those uh, critical points to you very clearly. And um, it works properly. Like, it doesn't fall over when you send it the wrong, the wrong message. It, it does, but it does in the way that it's supposed to, not the way it's not supposed to. And uh, it doesn't frustrate you. It might frustrate you technically, but it doesn't frustrate you uh, in a way that would not be part of the challenge. So I gave you one example of a great challenge. I want to give you a couple others. So just quickly imagine a web application um, that you would see in a CTF competition. You know, it's white background. It's got a couple text boxes, and uh, the typical uh, approach to these is like a black box web app pen test, where you have to type some things into the text box, and some error messages pop up, and then you find the challenge, and then you find, you know, with the challenge. But instead of having to type something into the text box, you go to the page, and there's already an error message, like MySQL query failed. So you already know there's going to be something to do with SQL, SQL injection, something like that. So you don't even have to put in the single quote or the double quote into the text box to, to reach the critical point of what do I need to solve in this challenge. And that's, that's the kind of um, shift in, in challenge writing that I want to see. Um, and I also think any challenge with, that gives you source code would fall under this category because 
um, we assume that everyone knows how to program. So if you can just read code, you can find all these critical points much easier than if you were given a black box web application or black, any, any kind of black box application. So another case study. Um, this is an easy web challenge that we also had for Seesaw CTF, I think, in 2008 or 9. And you're given an IP address and a port. And so the first thing you do is you netcat to it, and you send it some data. And we see that it's a web server because it gave us a 400. And this is a critical point because we need to realize it's a web server. And it did its job, and we realize it's a web server. The next thing is we find that it's a custom web server written in Python, and it hosts a single static web page. So now what do we do? Any ideas? What? Oh, someone said something. Because the web page doesn't have any information on it. It's just like, hey, welcome to Seesaw CTF. It's a boring, static web page. Sure, the headers the headers are normal. Um, good, good, good ideas. But well, we we can see the whole page. You pull down the whole page. There's nothing. It's just boring. Excellent idea. Um, and let's say that gives us the same page. What next? Yep. It's another great idea, but see, like, these are all possible solutions. I'm not saying that any of these are wrong. These, are, these would all make great challenges, but the problem is that we're guessing at what to do next. The, user, the competitor doesn't have a path. They're now frustrated by trying random things until something works. And this is a critical point that was not handled gracefully. And we call this a frustration point. I just named it. Um, so the solution is to actually send a trace request, which I don't know. I don't know how you would figure that out. Um, but I, I think I did figure it out. But whatever it was. It, it, was, it was frustrating. But you finally get to the answer, and, and it's still considered an easy challenge. Um, anyone playing uh, the Source Boston CTF? All right. That was a flag for the Source Boston CTF. I think you, I think you missed it. Um, all right. So... Bad challenges. I don't want to label this challenge as horrible or anything, because it's, it's a pretty good challenge, but I'm going to put it under the category of bad challenges because it gives you an opportunity to waste your time. And um, you don't want that, especially when you're, when you're limited time and your goal is to, the goal is to learn, the goal is to solve challenges and be on the top of the scoreboard. Um, Bad challenges don't teach you anything. I'm not saying that this particular challenge didn't teach anyone anything, but if there's no room to learn in the challenge, um, maybe the challenge should be redesigned. Um, you don't want to frustrate competitors for non reasons, like guessing what to do next. Um, you don't want someone to search endlessly, so if they're given like some arbitrary hint that looks like an inside joke that you see a lot in these uh, Korean CTFs, they end up having to Google this thing forever until they find the answer. Um, you certainly don't want someone to brute force something that's not technically relevant. And um, I'm also going to talk about quality assurance testing your challenges a little bit later. But all challenges should be QA'd by multiple people so that we know that they work, they stand up, they're interesting, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to give you some other examples of bad challenges. Um, CTF has this horrible stigma towards forensics. Now, forensics is great. It's interesting and all that stuff. But the problem is the people who run CTFs don't understand what forensics really is. So when they write forensics challenges, they end up being like steganography or something that doesn't really make sense. Like uh, one image has an EXIF 
a comment in a pile of one million images, and you have to find that EXIF comment, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes, hypothetically speaking. Uh, so these are the, I'm trying to give examples from all, uh, all these past challenges, of all the past challenges that I've uh, thought of, but I don't want to point out any particular challenge, any particular CTFs or challenges because, um, yeah. Also, QR codes. No one likes QR codes. It was popular back in 2011 to take a QR code and then just mangle the image so your phone couldn't read it and you had to reassemble it by hand. And um, there was one CTF recently that shipped a undocumented virtual machine and custom emulator down to users and the idea was they had binaries written in this custom architecture and you had to figure out how the architecture worked without any documentation. It was, it, well that's a great reverse engineering thing, a challenge that's uh, it's very difficult to do in 24 hours and um, yeah. So finally, I want to talk about realistic challenges. And um, these realistic challenges are going to have elements from both the good challenges and the bad challenges. And um, yeah. So the first one is uh, a challenge that Brandon Edwards wrote for Seesaw CTF, uh, the final round uh, this past year. And what it was is a, a window that ran on Windows 3.11, 16-bit, inside a VM. And I'm sure you can already imagine the pain. Um, but so this is 16-bit x86. That means that there was no EIP. There was only IP. And all the registers, all, you know, all the registers 16-bit, all the shell code had to be 16-bit. So the first thing is you had to reverse this binary. That was in 16-bit x86. I think there were some problems running it in IDA, and then you had to debug the program from inside um, Windows 3.11, which was also a challenge. And um, so after you find the vulnerability and you go to exploit it, it's a buffer overflow, you go to exploit it, and um, you jump to some shell code. So you have to write your own 16-bit shell code, and then you jump to your shell code on the stack, and an exception is thrown. The exception is thrown because Windows 3.11 used segments back in, I don't know, was that 80s, 90s? And the reason they used segments is because 16 bits wasn't large enough to have all of memory in a flat model. So your stack and your data and your code were in different segments. That means you couldn't jump to, you couldn't return or jump to code that wasn't in the code segment. Kind of like DEP, but accidental. Um, so you had to use a modern exploitation technique to actually take care of this. You had to return to libc in Windows 3.11, which as you can imagine is not the easiest thing. Um, so this is a challenge that turned out to have a lot of modern components. Um, for, for an ancient, for an ancient uh, platform. And uh, the idea is that because uh, the students reversing, uh, exploiting, and uh, analyzing this binary would have to learn all these things in order to get the, the challenge to work. That's why we call it realistic. Um, I wrote a 64-bit, uh, very contrived Internet Explorer clone for Windows XP. The idea is we can write, we can model this to read in a HTML-like file and build a tree that would have similar vulnerabilities to what you would see like in Internet Explorer, or Firefox, Chrome, without the sandbox. And students would have to go through this potentially large binary and find very complex vulnerabilities like use after freeze and um, heap overflows, etc. Um, so we call this realistic because this is the thing that people are doing right now, finding bugs in Internet Explorer. Um, so the way to solve this one is you find the use after free. There's a way to, uh, 
the application actually gave you an executable heap if you sent it the right HTML looking file and uh, you can just jump from your use after free right into the executable heap and uh, run your shell code. Um, we had this other challenge written by uh, Jeff Jarmok, uh, something about cryptography. It was a web server. I don't really know a lot about it because I don't know a lot about cryptography, but it was a web server that chipped you down um, a, a, an authentication certificate. So you'd authenticate through uh, a user certificate and instead of a username and password. And um, there was an error in the way that the SSL library was, was uh, or generating these certificates. And if you can figure that out based on just looking at the certificates that were shipped down to you, you would figure out that you would have to generate your own certificate using a special, using the correct pair of primes. And that certificate would be equal to the administrator certificate and you can log in as the administrator. Um, we call that relevant because uh, all the SSL stuff that's going on that I really don't understand. But everyone, everyone said it was very relevant. Um, also, the we, so we talked earlier about not doing black. Yep. So, so these these realistic challenges are somewhere in the middle of good and bad challenges. Um, yeah. Um, so we talked earlier about the, the the black box web app challenges being potentially bad challenges because the user doesn't know what input to do, what, what to do next. Um, but in a realistic situation, you have to do, a, uh, you, you see a lot of black box web app pen tests uh, all over the place. So the skills to do this need to be um, understood and taught by competitors at some point. So under realistic, we put this black box blind SQL injection uh, challenge that we had, I believe, two years ago for CSAW CTF. I don't have a link for that, but um, the idea was there was a it was a it was a huge web app and it had multiple blind SQL injections vulnerabilities that you had to find and you had to slowly escalate your privilege up to administrator where you can dump the database and get the key. Um, and all the blind SQL injection vulnerabilities were different, so you couldn't just write a script to run through the whole website. Um, Finally, there was a, a recent CTF called Hackathon. It was written by a couple friends of mine, and it was it was done really well. What they did is they they wrote uh, a new architecture for the CTF and a, and a virtual machine and an emulator for it, and but it was all documented this time. So the idea was everyone who was playing the CTF, the CTF took place over a couple of months. Everyone who was playing the CTF had to learn the the new architecture and reverse and exploit the binaries that they wrote in this architecture. Yeah. Um, that ran on this emulator. Um, so everyone was put on a level playing field and everyone had to do the same reverse engineering and the same challenges over the course of a couple months. And um, that kind of format worked really well because learning this architecture was not trivial. And then writing exploits in this architecture is not trivial. And reversing in this architecture is not trivial. A lot of people wrote their own uh, disassembly tools and uh, control flow graphing tools. And it was really cool. So realistic challenges are, are this cross between good and bad challenges. And, um, and, and they're practical. So they're useful and relevant in the real world. They're, 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 re they're realistic. Um, and what this means is, so like, uh, we talk about the the black box web app and uh, black box uh, web application testing uh, type challenges, and that's something that a lot of people do every day as their jobs, and um, that's a skill that you can directly translate into uh, into a professional setting. Um, these challenges make you make you uh, think about. Um, the problems holistically, and uh, so a lot of a lot of complaints about CTF end up being, oh, well, these challenges are all contrived, and you know only someone who's good at throwing uh, throwing a brick at a wall will be able to, uh, you know, be able to solve these very small set of contrived challenges that you sort of learn how to deal with over time. But to that I say, these realistic challenges are 
this kind of stuff you see in the real world. These are um, realistic, and uh, they're not they're not what I would call CTF challenges, but they're 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 real challenges. They're um, they make you reason intelligently about the problem. And these challenges may be frustrating, just like real challenges in the real world are frustrating, but they aren't frustrating to the point where you have to go and jump out of a window. They're, they're, um, they're reasonable for the time period. They're um, reasonable for your skill set, et cetera, et cetera. A any questions about how I, dis how I dis dis distinct the good challenges, the bad challenges, and the realistic challenges, or the other way around? So finally, I'm going to go through this quick. I think I'm running out of time. Um, talk about running a CTF. Um, this is mostly uh, me telling you not to run a CTF. Um, it's an incredible amount of work, but it's also incredibly rewarding. So as much as I'm telling you not to run a CTF, I'm also telling you, please run more CTFs. We need more of them. We need to spread awareness of this stuff. We need to spread quality CTFs, quality challenges, all this stuff. So this is just a short list of some of the things you need to do in order to have a CTF at all. Um, you need a scoreboard, you need registration for teams, you need a network, you need challenges. This is the, the biggest one is challenges. Um, you, you know, after everyone wins, some way to acknowledge the winners. Uh, logistics, if you're having a, a CTF on site, if you're having uh, you know, CTF online, anywhere there's logistics. Marketing, if no one knows your CTF exists, then you can't, and no one's going to play it. Um, sponsorship, if you have cash rewards, whatever. And quality assurance for the challenges to put that at the end, because it's often an afterthought, even though it shouldn't be. It was an afterthought when I was writing the slide, when it shouldn't have been. Um, so a, C a CTF competition requires a huge amount of effort and dedication, a huge amount of infrastructure, and a huge amount of challenge design and development, and that's probably the biggest one. And um, I had this bullet point at the end. Team, you really need a team of people to do this. Um, Seesaw CTF is not run by just me. We have uh, a dozen or so people working on logistics, and we have 35 people writing the challenges. And that turns out about 35 challenge. That turns out about 20 to 40 challenges for the qualification round, and 15 challenges for the final round. Um, 35 people. Um, but don't let this deter you from running a CTF. Also, the the Ghost in the Shell crew team is about 20 people, and the guys who ran uh, DefCon CTF for the past couple of years, DD Tech, they've been anywhere from uh, 30 to 50 people. So this is. Not, not a trivial effort, but but don't let this deter you. If you're if you're focused and and you're you're set on uh, doing this, definitely do it. So these are the points that I want to I want to leave you with. Um, CTF competitions are fun, and CTF competitions provide a unique challenge. And like um, like solving a Rubik's cube or any kind of game like that. Um, it provides this. It provides a, a unique intellectual um, challenge. You should invest time in solving quality challenges because it'll help you develop as a security professional. And you should invest time in creating quality challenges for the same reason. Um, writing these challenges will also teach you things. Writing these challenges will will help you walk through a lot of the problems that we talked about and and um, hopefully increase your skill set. Um, if you want to run a CTF, uh, CTF competition, you should find someone who's run one before. So you don't get too far, over, uh, too far uh, in over your head before it's too late. Um, and finally, CTF competitions are critical to the advancement of information security. And that's a bold statement, but I really think, as we talked earlier, CTFs can be this, um, this, this skill uh, identifier that that can really set other people apart from everyone if the competitions are designed correctly, run correctly, etc. Um, so finishing up, I want to thank everyone who's ever been involved in the CTF competition. If I put everyone's names on this slide, 
you know, they'd all be one pixel thick. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people um, that made this possible. And finally, some resources. This is not the first CTF talk that's ever been given. Some of my favorites are here. Um, and that's it. Any questions? That's, uh, hmm, that's the Zach. Yeah, we actually, so, yeah, there, there are challenges that involve social engineering. We actually have a category of challenges for CSF called where we have the judges hide a key in like their social online profile somewhere, and the teams have to go and dig through their life and uh, figure out where the key is. And we get a lot of people, end up like um, one of our judges, uh, uh, someone found one of our judges' wife's phone number and started calling her in the middle of the night during the CTF competition, um, asking for the key. Yeah, so something I didn't talk about, there, there, are, there are always online CTFs. There are a lot of, um, they call them war games, that are challenges that, are, that never go offline. CTFs are short-lived. There are archives of all the challenges, and uh, there are a couple links in there. And you, can, you can just Google like CTF archives, and you'll find a bunch of them. And there's plenty of opportunity to learn all this stuff. And there's online communities and people. And um, we have a channel on the ISIS IRC server where we just talk about CTF competitions and stuff like that. Um, and I think my time's up, but we, I can definitely give you more resources offline, et cetera.